All right, I'm just going to run you through real fast how to fill in the data table for part one of the centripetal force lab. I'm going to be showing you on the simulation, but it will be the exact same way to fill out the data table for the in-class version. So the simulation is the one where Isaac Newton is going to be uh, doing his thing, moving the, swinging the thing around his head. We're going to mess with the washers. We're going to change the length. I'm going to leave the mass the same. So here is what we're going to do. By the way, everything that I'm going to tell you is written out here in part one instructions and you can see in blue here what goes in each column in case you forget. So when I come down to part one, trial is just going to be trial one. We go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way down. The mass is going to be the mass of the thing that's swinging around, the moving mass. In this case it's 25 grams. So if I convert that to kilograms, which I have to, I'm going to move the decimal three times to the left. And when I move that thing three times to the left, what I get is 0 0.025. I don't need to put the units because the units are already up here. It says kilograms, newtons, meters, meters, seconds, meters per second, and newtons there. So you can see you don't actually have to write the units every single time. For centripetal force, centripetal force is going to be the weight of the washers down here. You'll notice that for the simulation, each washer has a mass of 10 grams. So 10 washers, 10 grams each, that would be 100 grams. So you measure the mass of the washers, and again, we can change that to be whatever we want it to be. So I'm clicking at random, we'll make it 14. So 14 would be 140 grams, but we need to change that to kilograms. So I'd move the decimal three times to the left, so 140 would become 0.14. Then I'm going to take 0.14, I'm going to multiply it by 9.8, and that's going to get me a centripetal force of 1.372 if I want to keep three decimals. So that's how much I've got here on the bottom. For part one, you were supposed to change this radius, the length of this string right here, to one meter if you're doing the simulation. If you're doing the in-class version, then you're going to be changing that to be um, 0.5 meters. So it's going to randomize this. I'm going to try to get it as close to that 100 as I possibly can. Keep shooting just a little bit over. Oh, might have had it that time, but I rushed. There we go. We're exactly 100 now. So my radius is going to be 100 centimeters, but we don't want it in centimeters. We want it in meters, so just one. And for this radius, this mass, it's going to be 0 0.025 or all the way down. This is going to be the radius, one one, one, and so on and so forth, because the mass isn't going to change, the radius isn't going to change, and also this is the circumference. The circumference is 2 times pi times r. 2 times pi is 3.14, and r is 1, so this is just going to be, in the simulation, 6.28. And that's going to be 6.28 the whole way down, because we are never changing the radius for part 1, which means we're never changing the circumference, and we're never changing this mass. So the only thing I've calculated really thus far is this centripetal force, measure this and have the circumference, and now we're actually ready to do the lab. By the way, the circumference would be 3.14 if you make it a half a meter for the in-class version. So now I'm going to get the time. How do I get the time? The time is how long it takes to go around once. I'm going to have him start just for the sake of time. I'm just going to count it spinning around 10 times, uh, especially once this gets going really fast. You're probably going to want to do the full 30 which it says to do in the instructions. You can see up in the instructions it asks you to do that. So, And then after the 30 revolutions, you hit the pause button. That's step five. Again, I'm just going to do 10 for the sake of time for the video. And also when he first starts, without too much weight down here, it's not going crazy fast. But once this thing gets really going, it's tough to stop it at exactly the end of a revolution. So I recommend doing the full 30. So here we go. I'm going to start. There's one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That looks like I did a pretty good job of getting that to stop right at the end. If it went a little bit uh, past or didn't quite get there, that's going to be okay because that's why we do 10 or 30 revolutions, uh, especially when it gets going really fast, because that little itty bitty mistake of stopping it at not exactly the right time is going to be minimized when we do it over 30 revolutions, or in this case, 10. So what I'm going to be doing is figuring out how long did it take to go around once. I take my total revolutions, which was 10 in this case, and I'm going to take my time and divide it by that number. 
So I'm going to do 8.5 is my total time divided by the number of revolutions. In this case, it was 10. And that's going to tell me how long it took to go around once. That's what goes in this column. So I have 8.5 divided by 10, which is 0.85. If I spun it around 30 times, I take the total time and I divide it by 30. But that's what goes here in the time section. Now for velocity. Velocity is circumference divided by time. The total distance, that's one time around, divided by how long it took to go one time around. So for velocity, it's going to be 6.28 divided by 0.85, and that tells me that the velocity of this thing was 7.38, not 39, meters per second. All right, so that's gonna be the velocity of this thing, and now I'm ready to go to calculating my centripetal force. We say, but we have centripetal force here. This is the weight of the washers. This is calculating it, and this number and this number should be pretty darn close to each other. If they are, then we know we did this correctly. So how do I calculate the centripetal force? We're going to use the equation. You can see it right here, up on, just slightly above the uh, data table, mv squared over r. So I take my m, which is 0 0.025, times v squared, which is 7.39 squared. And then I'm going to divide that by r, which is 1. And when I... Dividing by one is basically doing nothing. And what I get is 1.365, which is pretty darn close to 1.37. So I know that I did everything correct because this number and this number are really darn close to each other, which means this time I did a pretty good job of getting that. So that's how you fill in this data table for trial two. I would just hit two. Again, mass does not change for the centripetal force. I would just add a little bit more weight. Let me reset that. Add a little bit more weight. There we are up at 18. And I calculate a new weight for this centripetal force. Radius doesn't change, circumference doesn't change. I'd hit start, measure my time for 10 to 30 rotations, and I'd solve everything the same way. So that's how you do part one of the centripetal force lab.